I V M. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm Sudisha, Judea Research Scholar at the Takshashila Institution, who is contributing towards the 20 Million Jobs Project. Today I have with me Professor K.R. Sham Sundar, who is a labor economist and professor at the Xavier School of Management, Jamshedpur. He has written some very important books on labor in India, including Impact on COVID-19, Reforms and Poor Governance on Labor Rights in India, A Critical Analysis of Industrial Relations Code, and Labor Law and Governance Reforms in India, Some Critical Perspectives, among other books. Today, we are going to talk about the labor law reforms that have been in mentions in the last two years in India. So India has a labyrinth of approximately 200 labor laws, out of which one-fourth are central laws. Among other reasons for having labor laws, the most important ones are to ease economic development for establishments and to make sure that workers' worker rights are protected. But because of such a complex network of labor laws, the government decided to do away with some of those and combine them into four labor codes, which have been in the talks in the last two years. Implementation is being carried out, but it's not been done completely. But amidst all this, the fact remains that there have been protests from trade unions and workers towards these new labor codes. And today we have Professor Sham Sundar with us, who will discuss on why these labor codes are being protested against what are some gaping loopholes that are in these labor law codes and what can be done to improve upon that. So hi, Professor. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. It's my pleasure to join this podcast. Thank you. So we'll start with the first question, which is why you think India needed these labor law reforms? Well, whether I think it is necessary or not, the employers' organizations uh, And the global financial institutions like World Bank definitely argued for um, labor law reforms uh, on four principal uh, grounds. Number one, the labor laws are dated and archaic. They were framed during the era of colonial period and later during the phase of economic planning. And post-1991, in general, we are witnessing a tremendous and significant change in the economic environment uh, in which India is uh, positioned. It's a globalized world where markets are dominant. That is reason number one. Reason number two, the labor laws are numerous and definitions of uh, critical aspects like workmen, wages, etc. differ across the labor laws. And they need to be codified and some of the labor laws are rather severe in terms of its intervention in the employer-employee relationship or employers trade unions collective relationship. And finally, labor laws have certain provisions for governance, that is the inspection and administrative system, which are quite, which prove to be quite cumbersome and take away a lot of uh, time of the employers. So these are the four grounds, three or four grounds, principal grounds on which employers and global financial institutions have called for labor law reforms. At the same time, I should also mention that trade unions have also been calling for labor law reforms, but the reasons are exactly opposite. They feel, they submit that the labor laws are inadequate in the era of globalization as uh, economic insecurity, job insecurity, and declining real wages are predominant. So they want consolidation. They want more protection to the employees and jobs. 
and they want it to be employer friendly. So there is a clear polarization, even though both the parties demand labor law reforms. I hope I have answered as simply as possible. Yeah, that was a really good answer. So now I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on the new labor reforms that have been introduced? You see, the the entire issue of codification of labor law, though labor law reforms have, I mean, I must, uh, I must inform the readers, the issue of labor law reforms was always there, even during the 1960s and 1970s. The first National Commission on Labor, headed by the eminent judge, Chief Justice of Supreme Court, Mr. Gayendra Kakkar, also recommended reforms of labor laws, but they were reforms providing for trade union recognition, compulsory trade union recognition, or for, uh, you know, reforming the conciliation and adjudication system. But the reforms that have been demanded by the employers during the globalization phase is totally different. If the reforms during the planning era was related to Settlement in industrial dispute settlement issues, the reforms during the market era called for tremendous amount of labor flexibility and power to the employers to be able to respond to the market forces. And the second National Commission on Labor, headed by Ravindra Verma, former labor minister, recommended its own set of reforms and also strongly recommended that this numerous central labor laws need to be codified. So the source of labor law reforms can be traced from the Second National Commission on Labor, though as a labor historian, I would go back to the, even to the Royal Commission on Labor 1930, Reggae Committee uh, in 1940s, and the First National Commission on Labor 1969, and so on and so forth. Now, you asked me a very broad question on the labor law reforms that have been effected. It is uh, well nigh impossible in a short a capsule time such as this to capture all the elements, but I will highlight a few of them. The wage code has removed the limited applicability of minimum wage law through scheduled employments by making it universal. That is, the last worker standing will be eligible for minimum wage, and that minimum wage will be nationally determined legally, a statutory legal national floral minimum wage, and the state governments or the region, at the regional level or at the state level cannot set uh, minimum wages lower than the national statutory for learning wage. So that was the, that was a very big bank reform, if I may call so. But I, I would come to the criticism of it a little later. Then there are three labor, uh, labor courts which are passed in 2020 amidst the COVID period in a rather hurried manner, even when the parliament was, uh, functioning of the parliament was very weak due to the walkout by the opposition parties. However, for the, the law uh, doesn't wait for uh, the parliament to function properly or not. The three labor codes have been enacted. One is on the industrial relations code. The second one is occupational uh, and safety and uh, working conditions code. OSH code, shall I call it uh, very briefly. And third one is the social security code. These codes in general have two aspects. So I'll make a broad brush. On the one hand, the, set, the these courts provide tremendous amount of flexibility to the employers by giving them power in order to determine not only the quantity of employees or workers to be employed at a given point of time, but also their composition. What do I mean by quantity of labor? For example, the thresholds of Laws like the Factories Act or the contract regulations relating to the Contract Labor Act or regulations relating to hire and fire or standing order have all been revised in such a manner to exclude many, many factories. In fact, 90% of the factories in the organized manufacturing sector employed less than 20 workers. So most of the, the one year a handful of estimate factories employ around more than one third of the employment in the factory sector. So we see that any deregulation in, in terms of uh, changing of the thresholds will have a huge implication on the welfare of the workers. So the government has changed the threshold 
from 100 to 300 for a free hire and fire and uh, 100 to 300 in terms of formulation of the standing orders, 20 to 40 in terms of the factory sacks and 10 to 20 with power and 20 to 50 in terms of the Contract Labor Regulation Abolition Act. So these are the critical aspects that will affect the labor rights of the workers, the so-called worker, organized sector workers, because now it will be easily possible for the principal employer to hire contract workers by employing less than 50 contract workers and without being regulated by any law. It will be easy for the factories to operate below the threshold and be not regulated. It will be easy for the employers to hire and fire in establishments employing 300 or less workers, less than 300 workers. Similarly, it is not mandatory for the employers to frame a standing order to govern terms and conditions of employment establishments employing less than 300. You see, the employers have been given tremendous amount of power. On the other hand, the government also has introduced the fixed term employment on the one hand and the contract labor on the other hand, which will determine the composition of employment. Now, we are going to witness once the labor codes are implemented, less and less of regular workers, more and more of contract workers, more and more of fixed term employees, more and more of uh, temporary workers. And uh, of course, along with that, the government has schemes like NEEM or uh, National Apprenticeship Scheme. All these are being put to uses which are not meant uh, originally by the schemes. So this is one part which considerably enhances the bargaining power of the employers in the labor market. On the other hand, there have been provisions which are which take away or weaken the labor power of the work, work, working class. For example, according to the new industrial relations code, it will be tremendously impossible for the workers to launch a legal strike because of the conditions that are attendant on the conduct conduct of the legal strike. I will not go into the technicalities uh, sufficient to observe that the conditions for go going on a legal strike has have been substantially strength, you know, strengthened and they would crowd out the legal strikes and go slow or, I mean, sorry, mass casual leave also has been included in the definition of strikes. Let me go to the third aspect, which is the social security to the labor courts provide social security, the answer is yes or no. For the organized sector employees, it has retained the same thresholds, 10 workers for ESI, medical insurance, and 20 workers for uh, Provident Fund. That remains the same. Maternity, worker, maternity benefit for women workers, 80 days of employment. But what about the unorganized workers? In terms of the unorganized workers, the courts have not done enough justice at all. It provides for the central government and the state government to frame certain social security schemes, but it does not specify the modalities of the funding of the schemes. It does not specify in the law anything. It all leaves it to the rules, which will be the discretion of the executive. It, whereas it should have been the discretion of the legisl legislature to have pinpointed these are the social security components that unorganized workers would enjoy. The funding is not clear. Even the 2008, what I call bad law, the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act has been diluted because the Social Security Code does not provide for issuance of a portable smart identity card. Now, we all know during the, during the pandemic that the central government and the state governments, you know, deposed before the Supreme Court that they do not have any data or the migrant workers, or the interstate, interstate migrant workers, or the non-organized workers. Now we have a position, a, a kind of a falsified position is being taken by the government that there'll be universal social security code. Nothing can be farther than, than this. Uh, nothing can be farther from, 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 from this. The truth is, it has retained the social security provisions regarding the organized sector workers. It has only promised social security provisions without providing for from where the funds will come, how the funds will come, who will be the contributors, etc. So uh, I would say 
giving a broad brush view that accepting for the promise of the universal mini, universal minimum wage and promise of social security the the labor codes are a big disappointment as far as the workers are concerned in all the workers and the uh, of course the trade uh, industry, uh, industry relations code provides for compulsory recognition of trade unions subject to certain criteria again which is a problem of details i will not get into that but it is a good thing that the government has provided for compulsory recognition of trade unions but it has provided compulsory recognition of trade unions on the one hand but it has made striking very difficult so the question that arises is that then what is what is the, what what do what do trade unions do they can't go on strike they'll be uh, it would be deemed to be illegal because of the stringent conditions and the penalties for the illegal strikes are very severe and of course hire and fire becomes easier so i would say on a very careful scrutiny of the labor laws whether it is uh, occupational safety or anything the the government has on a net basis has done you know the amendments in order to strengthen the hands of the employers and weaken the bargaining power of the workers and trade unions in general and particularly it's a grand failure as far as the interstate migrant workers and the unorganized workers are concerned i'll be happy to provide clarifications on any specific detail you may, you may want me to yeah so i think that was a really succinct answer for for what the labor law new labor law reforms are so um i'll come back to the worker aspect that you talked about that essentially their rights have been taken away but uh, first i want to talk about the establishment so you said that the way the new labor law reforms are framed it seems like they are helping establishments in a way right one can argue that this is sort of a necessity during covid-19 because so many establishments have suffered financial losses so many have been shut down so it's it's essentially a requirement for the government to ease economic development of such uh, establishments so would you say that in a way these reforms are good if you look See, from well, the establishment side yeah no even taking the employees perspective covid is a temporary phenomenon and covid cannot be the basis for laying the structure of labor laws so laying the structure of the lab, uh, labor laws which would be there on the statute books for um, years together now i can understand that if the government frames two sets of labor laws one for the small establishments and another for uh, medium and large establishments less stringent conditions for small establishments and regular normal conditions for the larger establishments then it would rather make sense but here what happens is that the government but let us take one particular example that you said it will it will ease ways of doing business now let us say the regulations relating to the contract workers we all know very well that it is the petty contractors it is the poor it is the lowly placed contractors who employ 10 workers or 15 workers or 18 workers or 20 workers or 22 or 40 workers these are the contractors who are fly by night operators and who default the social security payments who default in the payment of wages etc now companies like tata steel tata motors or maruti all these original equipment manufacturers or steel or or fmcg companies how does it help them to employ uh, small sized contractors who are whose financial capacity is not sound for example in china the contractors who, who need to be who, who should secure license and who should not secure license will will be determined by the capital that the contractor has so if the government really wants to protect the uh, enable the small size to contractors to come up in business it should not use worker size as the as the criterion for deter, for determining inclusion or exclusion so it should have it should have defined in like a defined micro and small medium industries it should have defined in terms of capital 
in terms of uh, what they bring on the book on the table. So that would have made sense rather than using the number of workers as the criterion for exclusion or inclusion. Again, let us come to the the factories. How do, how does it? Uh, for example, the Factories Act require uh, liberalization. The Factories Act should be made simpler. The Factories Act should be made easily compliant for all kinds of employers. But one cannot uh, wish away the aspect of safety and health. One cannot wish away the uh, decent conditions of work for the workers. Workers need ventilation. Whether you work in a small factory or a big factory, workers need protective gears. Work workers need occupational safety and health. Workers need washrooms. So what could have been done is to simplify the Factories Act. The original 1948 for Factories Act was in fact quite stringent. Spittoons must be there and whitewash, whitewashing should be done, etc., etc. Must not have been, should have been removed and they are being removed. What was necessary was to lay down certain minimum conditions of, uh, conditions of work and definitely stringent conditions for safety and health. Safety and health cannot be determined on the, in terms of size. For example, a large size company will be more safety compliant than a small sized company because the one has capital, the other doesn't have capital. But can we argue just because the, the small size companies don't have capital, that we should ignore the safety and health aspects of the workers? So, Corona or no Corona, COVID is, was an unexpected phenomenon. You must remember these codes have been uh, doing the rounds on the corridors of the parliament or elsewhere since 2015. So COVID came much later than these courts were drafted. I am all for, you know, making, doing far more easier than it was. But things could have been done much more imaginatively with consultation with of workers' bodies and seeking the opinion of the experts. For example, 100 to 300 uh, higher and fire, I would have no problem. But standing orders, making it 100 to 300 is a, is a mistake. And earlier, in Factory Act, all hazardous companies must have a safety committee. Now, hazardous uh, factories from 250 onwards will have a safety officer, but in other factories, the safety committee will be maybe constituted if the government issues notification. This is absurd. Hazardous factories, whether they are small or big, need safety and health conditions. So I'm not able to buy the argument that small businesses are facing tremendous amount of problems in terms of complying labor laws. They have problems in terms of taxation. They have problems in terms of raising financial resources. They have problems in terms of marketing the products. There are problems in terms of coping up with the technological know-how. but it is labor loss is not really on the uh, top five reasons as being bothersome. So I sincerely, even though I'm, I'm from B school, I do understand how businesses work. They require flexibility, but the kind of flexibility that they need are much more different. It is not only just related to labor law. It, it relates to various aspects of doing business. For example, infrastructure, for example, energy, power needs finance, marketing. These are the things that small-scale industries are bedeviled with. So I don't think we can make a very sound case for uh, liberalizing certain basic requirements, minimum wages, occupational safety and health, social security must be provided for each and every worker irrespective of the size of establishments. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, you have it. You made a very interesting point that COVID is a one-time phenomenon, but these laws will carry on even after, you know, we see some recovery from whatever has happened in the pandemic. I'll come to the next question, but before that, let's take a short break. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On Advertising is Dead, Varun talks to co-founder and CEO of Yoga Bar, Suhasini Sampath. She shares the secrets behind making energy bars without preservatives. 
On Voices for Water, Karthik asked Dr. Bhakti Devi, founding president of Water Resources Council, about water literacy in India. On Ek Chuski Finance, Priyanka explains the concept of a financial slam book. On Pulya Bazi, Pranay and Saurabh ponder over how the Indian armed forces can reduce the cost of pensions. And on Marathi Kirki Tun, the Deshmukhs explore the works of the popular writer Ram Chandra Chintaman Dere. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, please don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on. And remember, you can always check us out on YouTube. We have a number of channels. You can go to ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube to take a look at what those channels are. We're also doing a small listener survey to understand how you respond to our shows and the advertising on the network. We would really, really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to fill it out. It really helps us build better shows for you and understand what you're looking for from advertising and what we can talk to advertisers about about who you are. Please go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It really, really, really would help us out. Thank you so much. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors for the network this week, SBI Life Insurance, India Water Portal, and Jupiter, a digital banking app. Thank you so much for making this possible. We are back. So my next question is, one of the basic problems before the labor law reforms were introduced was rent-seeking behavior. Proper inspections were not carried out, even if there were inspectors were delving in rent-seeking behavior, and this was leading to a lot of exploitation in a way. Do you think that the new labor law reforms have taken this into consideration? And if they have not, what should be done for making sure that rent-seeking behavior is not encouraged to these labor laws? Yeah. So this is one of the you know criticisms of the labor laws that were uh, framed during the colonial and planning era and which was supported by a very strong labor administrative system. I certainly do grant that labor inspection could be a nuisance to the employers. That is primarily because the in the older system, the inspectors had what we call in labor economics as the discretion to choose which factories need to be inspected and which factories need not be inspected. So the labor inspectors enjoyed huge power without any overall supervision by higher officials they enjoyed a certain amount of discretion and that discretion was not regulated or controlled. And what, what would they do? Yeah, because the inspector establishment ratio in India is not adequate for the inspectors to cover the universe of the establishments to be inspected. Simply put, there are not enough inspectors to inspect all the factories and all the establishments in India. So what do they do? They know very well there are several vulnerable uh, establishments and factories and they would visit them. For example, let us take the Factories Act. The Factories Act, I can tell you, even the most benevolent employers such as Tata Steel or Mahindra Automobiles or TVS, even they can be pulled up by taking one provision of the Factories Act and said that, look, you are not compliant in terms of this, I came across during my field study, a particular firm, I didn't see a white wall at all. So uh, it was a small company employing less than 50 workers. So the owner said that, the employer said that, look, professor, what happened was that every now and then they would come and say, it has not whitewashed, it has not had lime wash, etc. So I tiled the entire factory. So then there is no question of an inspector coming and taking money from me on grounds of not whitewashing the factory. So that is so that is to the ludicrous and you know a extremely ridiculous way in, in which inspections can go. So it shows the darker side of inspection. Yes, inspections needed reforms and need reforms. But what was done was to throw the water along with the baby. Inspections must be there and it should be along the lines of the Labor Inspection Convention 081-1947. Inspection should be conducted regularly, frequently, 
and even without announcement and as many times as possible so as to ensure that the firms are compliant with the labor laws. These are the essential principles of labor inspection. And how it is designed, how it is delivered is company, I mean, a country's particular administrative system. Now, what they have done, they have removed, you know, they have liberalized labor inspection to such a level, it is randomized and self-certification has been brought in. And it is randomized in the sense that, and also, you know, an inspection for every five years, unless and until complaint driven inspection will take place. And in some, in some states like Punjab, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Telangana and other places, the employers have to certify that they are compliant with the law. So a lot of liberalizations have been, uh, and, uh, and numerous uh, liberalization measures have been taken by various state governments and a new, you know, term had entered into the, into the discourse on uh, labor law reforms and governance, Inspector Raj, to say that inspection, to paint the inspection in a pejorative manner. As I said, reforms of inspections were needed, but if only if India had consulted the International Labor Organization, which has social dialogue and labor administration wing, they could have easily come out with somewhat sensible and sensible designing of labor inspection system and also which is both employer friendly and worker friendly. But now what has been done is that it has broad dish painted that all inspection systems are bad, all inspectors are bad, and the entire inspection system needs to be hauled up and so that they have brought in new systems and even it provides for electronic based inspection system. I cannot understand how an inspector can do inspection online to do online inspection. So as I said that, and, and I'm, I'm not even finding fault with the term inspector come facilitator because according to the labor inspection convention of ILO, uh, that there are three duties of the labor inspector. Number one, to ensure that the labor laws are adequately and fully complied with by the employers. Number two, to provide technical assistance to both employers and employees to enable compliance of labor laws. And number three, to collect and provide information to the government so that labor laws could be this amended in order to make them to be compliant. So these are the three uh, functions defined by the Labor Inspection Convention. So I don't I have no quarrels with the term inspector come facilitator, but it cannot become just facilitator. There is no prosecution without the prior authorization. Inspections cannot go on sometimes, and uh, and uh, prior intimated in inspections will take place, and randomized inspections will take place, self certifications will take place. Now, just uh, uh, Delhi last one week, uh, there was some cinema hall accident, uh, and then there was some. Uh, in Telangana or Andhra Pradesh, there was some very gruesome accident that has taken place. Then during the COVID period in Vizag, LG Polymer Company, there's a gas leak that took place. So we see that even after liberalizing inspection, we are witnessing tremendous, I mean, a, a substantial number of rise in the fatal inspections. I'm not talking of non-fatal inspections. And we don't have inspections data. We don't have accidents data. We don't have, you know, unless unless we have inspections data, unless we have accidents data, unless we have compensation data, how can we, you know, frame a sensible and pragmatic and also employee friendly? Because the inspection needs to be employee friendly. Because if laws are complied with, then employee welfare is automatically ensured. If laws are not complied with, then employees' welfare are not complied with. What the uh, employers are failing to understand is that if sensible inspection systems are there, it would in fact augment the productivity of the employees because of safe and workable conditions of work will only boost the morale of the workers, ensure the safety of the workers and lead to overall economic efficiency, which we call in economics as productivity of the establishment and particularly labor productivity. So if there are any clarifications on this, I'm, I'll be happy to provide. No, it was a very interesting answer. 
I noticed when you said that ILO was not consulted properly for this. And if it were the case, then maybe these reforms could have been better. So, and, and before also you said that these reforms were passed really fast and were not, and stakeholders were not consulted properly. So I want to ask this question. Do you agree that every stakeholder who was important in the in passing these labor law reforms, they were not consulted? I know that when it comes to labor laws, India has to have tripartite consultation. Do you think it was not honored? I've heard that trade unions are saying that it was not honored and they were not consulted properly. Uh, do you agree with that? And if you don't, what could have been done differently? Yeah. Firstly, India has a it has a very very uniquely positioned country in the one of the uniquely positioned countries in the world as far as social dialogue is concerned. It started in 1942 during the because of the exigencies of the Second World War. The Indian Labour Conference and the Standing Labour Committee were were uh, formed along the lines of the International Labour Conference, etc. And we have had years and years of bipartisan. Of course, bipartisan was not really active. From 1972 to mid 1990s, because of various conditions, let us not go into it. But but the most recently held tripartite inter Indian Labour Conference, I believe it is in 2015 or so. So that is definitely a social dialogue deficit. The government, see what happens is that I would not put the blame entirely on the government. I would put the blame on all the three parties to the social dialogue. The government representatives, the employers representatives, and the trade union representatives. If the tripartite conference is a platform for, you know, providing sermons and repeating the same old points of, you know, points of differences by each of the party, I, I mean, then why do you want to hold the Indian Labour Conference? That is what way to look at it. What is social dialogue? Social dialogue is sharing of information, sharing of details and exchange of uh, exchange of even uh, more, much more than information, uh, statistical data, information and people coming together with a predetermined attitude of uh, give and take, compromise and being pragmatic about it, setting, putting aside ideology. These are the things that define social dialogue. So trade unions stick to their ideology, the employers stick to their ideology and the government becomes simply a witness, that is to say a bystander and if at all it is, it, it implicitly or explicitly takes the pro-employer view, then social dialogue will be automatically a failure. So I would rather blame the trade unions for having missed the opportunity of, you know, providing some kind of, the trade unions know, they are seeing on the field at the micro level that that market conditions have changed, the product market conditions have changed, markets are becoming dominant, markets are even becoming unpredictable. So there should have been some flexibility that trade unions could have been adopted. Pragmatic flexibility, I call it. Similarly, the employers should have also, I mean, the employers were driving for flexibility as if it is absolutely impossible to run a company without flexibility. That is, that is taking the argument far too, uh, far too much. Similarly, the workers that the entire, uh, all the employers are extremely capitalistic and exploitative and giving them uh, power would mean a death of labor rights. And the uh, government cannot take the side implicitly or explicitly and make statements that, you know, the yesterday labor laws have not served the cause of labor welfare, which was repeated by, which was uttered by both Mr. Atal Bigari Vajpayee and Dr. Manmohan Singh. And of course, Mr. Modi also has talked about the labor inspection system. So when prime ministers speak badly about labor laws and labor inspection system, then automatically it sends adverse signals to the parties. So the government says that it got tired of uh, having, uh, having been in a no compromise zone. Trade unions, you know, trade unions say something and the, I mean, according to the trade unions, I do not, I have not attended these forum uh, meetings, so I would not be, just not my first-hand information. I tell you what I read in the popular press and otherwise, that pro the government promises something in the ILC and in other dialogue forums, and then 
they do not implement the promise and employers drive a hard bargain. So, I mean, it is, it's perfectly all right that employers and trade unions think in opposite directions. But capitalism is all about coexistence. And you, you coexist in a manner which is uh, beneficial for both of you. And social dialogue performs the function of building the bridges for the two parties who are not willing to walk closer to one another. So that is what a social dialogue is all about. And the government should be the facilitator. If the government becomes the aggressor and takes the side of employer, automatically the trade unions become suspicious of the government's motives. So that's what happens. The government can say, that we held three meetings, four meetings on such and such day. It's not the number of meetings that matter. It is the quality of conversation that could have taken place. It is the level of trust that the government was able to evoke from the social partners. So I would like to say that social dialogue would be fruitful, effective, and it takes time, of course, for the parties to, with the opposing ideologies to, I mean, why do you need a dialogue? Because ideologies are uh, opposed to one another. So there, there must be information shared, the evidence-based social dialogue should take place, arguments should be there. But at the end of the day, like in collective bargaining, the trade unions and employers come to collective agreement at the national level or at the state level, social dialogue should lead to some kind of a compromise. In collective bargaining, the unions give up something, the employers give up something, and then the collective agreement is made. If both of them stand rigid, stood rigid, then strikes would take place. Similar position here. Here I would put the entire blame on the governments for not being sensitive, but not be, and it has not even take, taken the, uh, again, the expertise of the ILO, which has got the social dialogue and labor administrative departments. So even though the government may claim that it has consulted, quote and unquote, uh, the trade unions or the social partners and cite the number of meetings that it held. But what I heard from, what I personally heard from the trade union leaders and also from in the popular press and the trade union outlets that they publish, it has been a hogwash. So real social dialogue has not taken place. And let me tell you very bluntly that all the three partners have together contributed in one way or the other for the failure of a very important democratic pluralistic process of rule making and law making in India, which is social dialogue. Great answer. I think we've reached the end point of our podcast. You discussed about what is missing from the labor law reforms with respect to worker rights, how worker rights have been compromised. And we also discussed about not ordering the tripartite consultation, what could have been better. I just want you to end with a final statement for anyone who's listening to the podcast. What do you have to say finally? Because you've been, you're such a famous labor economist in India. I just want you to give a final message to anyone who's listening on what could have been done differently. And is what hope do you have for the future when it comes to labor laws in our country? Yes, I do. I do have a lot of hope. Um, I'm an undying optimist. I, I mean, there is a. I mean, uh, it's, it is not end of the road. It's not end of the show for in, any of the tripartite constituents. The courts have not uh, come into effect. There is a lot of room for development. I mean, the improvement in the labor courts. Amendments could be brought on both employers and workers side and the government side. I would ideally, if I if I were a consultant of the government, like in pay committee, when pay commissions are implemented, there is an anomalous committee. I would constitute a committee which comprises academicians, academics, uh, very important. We have uh, national law universities. We have Department of Law in Delhi University and various other universities. So there are very competent lawmakers. So uh, number one, Stakeholder would be experts. Number two, you know, the representative from employer, representative from uh, trade unions, representative from government. And with the help of, of course, ILO will not directly get into any of these deliberations, but with the outside help of the ILO, what could be done is to study what are the reforms, what are the amendments that could be 
made to the labor courts because most of the provisions, substantive provisions of the labor courts are left to the rulemaking, which is the executive fiat. So they could be the lot of damage control exercise could be made and this committee could be constituted at the central national level. I appeal to the any of the, if there are any government, trade union or employer representatives or ILO representatives, I appeal to them that yeah, uh, similar to anomalous committee, a committee should be, advisory committee should be constituted with powers to recommend and the same could be considered and of course it could also have some MPs and they should be distributed in an all party meeting and then accordingly but one thing we need to understand the trade union leaders or the employers need to understand without the give and take approach we, we cannot be staring at a stalemate for years to come. Ease of doing business is as important as ensuring labor rights, particularly the labor rights for the unorganized workers. The government has ingloriously failed in providing for the labor, you know, social security for the unorganized workers. It's, I mean, we are all talking all the time about hire and fire. According to the economic census, 99.99% of the establishments employ less than 10 workers. So what are we talking about? 1%, 2% of the establishments according to Economic Census 2013. Let's talk about the unorganized workers. Let us talk about them. It's not just hire and fire and retrenchment and closure and others. They cannot dominate the labor law reforms debate so much. It's the gig economy workers. We need to find out whether gig economy workers are workers indeed and how, how, the, how the, they could be brought into under the rubric of labor laws and how one could establish like the California has done or the UK judiciary has done that they can be brought under the umbrella of traditional employer-employee relations. There are, far min, there are far many unorganized workers, agricultural workers, rural workers, all of them domestic workers self-employed workers, all of them are crying out uh, for a tremendous amount of labor welfare. So I think there is a need for labor law reforms debate to move away from hire and fire to much more important and socially very, very, you know, marginalized sections of the society like unorganized workers. And they deserve much more importance and attention than those workers who are in the organized sector. So going forward, I'll appoint an advisory or expert committee uh, to find out how best the labor courts could be improved and then implement them. And it could be only you know, a good, I mean, a good, I mean, there, there, there is no code that will satisfy all the uh, constituents in the labor market. Somewhere down the line, we need to understand that business survives, then the workers survive. Workers survive, then the business survives. And that will be the solution for the stalemate that is staring at us all the time, even after codes have been made. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for such a great podcast. And thanks to anyone who listened to it. Keep reading anything that we publish on the 20 Billion Shops Project and keep listening to all things policy. Thank you. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website, takshashila.org.in. Do you find yourself in a room full of people talking about investments and insurances and feel left out? Do you also want to understand how to spend your money wisely? Then you have come to the right place. Welcome to SBI Life Presents, A Sip of Finance 
a women exclusive podcast where we break down difficult financial topics into simple and straightforward episodes with your host Priyanka Acharya a finance expert who's been in the industry for 14 plus years and not just in english but in seven more languages so tune in every tuesday for fresh episodes on the ibm podcast network and all major podcast streaming platforms namaste this is cyrus brocha i am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available so what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show it's called cyrus says it's on ivm podcast you have to watch it and listen to it it's on our app it's on our website it's on the youtube channel it's on facebook there are many different ways don't bother me and ask me how uh, you have to find out we talk to different personalities many of them are known some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai but the point is it's fun and it's very therapeutic so please join in and listen to cyrus says 